Welcome and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. In this show, we cover a broad range of topics that cater to both commercial real estate newcomers and industry leaders alike. I'm your host, Giannis Papadakis, Business Development Manager at Crexy, and today we are thrilled to sit down with David Chasen, President and CEO of Pegasus Investments. First, a little bit about our guest. As President and CEO of Pegasus Investments, David Chasen oversees all aspects of the firm's comprehensive real estate advisory platform. He specializes in the acquisition and disposition of net leased retail properties throughout the country and provides a full range of investment advisory services to his clients, which range from 1031 exchange buyers and high net worth individuals to publicly traded REITs, live insurance companies, pension fund advisors, and family offices. The Pegasus platform is able to fulfill its clients' property management, leasing, project construction management, entitlements, tax appeals, and debt financing needs. Mr. Chasen received his BA in economics from the University of Southern California in 2004, fight on, uh, where he was elected go. senator uh, of the uh, Associated Suited Body. Prior to transferring to the University of Southern California in 2002, Mr. Chasen attended the University of California, Berkeley, where he studied political science, economics, and business administration. Mr. Chasen is active in various community and charitable organizations throughout Los Angeles, most notably the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. Mr. Chasen has served as vice chair of the Real Estate and Construction Division's Dinner Committee with the Jewish Federation and continues to play an active role within its leadership. Mr. Chasen resides in the Brentwood neighborhood of Los Angeles with his wife, Meredith, daughter, Willa, and son, Spencer. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I got to have you do that during every meeting. We got to start off that way. Right? Yeah, no, that's, make me sound great. That's a, a, <laughs> a, quite a, a history and a bio. Um, well, we both we both have, you know, something called, I was a senator. You're Greek. Yeah, right? so, yeah we invented you know, we senators. Can, so. We have that, right? So. <laughs> um, before we jump in, I'd love to get a little more about your background, your career path, kind of how you got to where you are now. Um, tell us more about where you're from and how you got your start in commercial real estate. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> I, I actually, my background is in uh, corporate finance. Uh, I worked when I was at USC. I worked at Interscope Records in the music business uh, on the finance and accounting side, and then uh, into their roll-up company, uh, Universal, uh, Universal Music Group, which had like, you know, Interscope, Geffen, A&M, DreamWorks, Island, Def Jam. Um, and uh, so I did that for three years, and uh, it was great, and I learned a lot, and I learned uh, what I didn't want to do, which was work at a, you know, big red tape uh, conglomerate where... Um, it was less of a meritocracy. And so uh, I left that position and uh, my dad was a broker. Um, and my dad always told me, do not get into brokerage. Um, it is for the uneducated. <laughs> I've spent a lot of money sending you to the fine, finest universities that the West Coast has to offer and uh, don't follow in my footsteps. And much to his dismay, I did exactly that. Um, I uh, initially wasn't, didn't have any intentions of joining the industry. Mm -hmm. um, when I left Universal, I really, I, I wanted to continue suiting up and going into an office so that I didn't fall into like, you know, the kind of, you know, living at your parents and waking up at 10 a.m. and kind of figuring out your day as you go along. I wanted to kind of keep that cadence going. So I started going to my dad's office really just to send out resumes and kind of do research on what I wanted to do next. And I saw what my dad was doing. And uh, love my dad, still still alive today. He's 81 and going strong and uh, great reputation, just ethical guy, the least salesman guy you could ever think of in your life. Um, and I saw what he was doing and I saw all of uh, how he was interacting with his colleagues and I, I saw a huge opportunity candidly and, and, and one thing led to another and uh, here we are today, 18 years later. Tell me a little bit about the opportunity that you saw and how it kind of motivated you to make the jump. Yeah, you know, look, I mean, there, I think there's 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 a couple types of people in this world. There's the people that have everything thought out well in advance and mapped out, and they have their one year and their you know five year and their ten year plan. I never had any of that. Um, it's not how I've lived my life. Um, I wish I had more of that, but it's just who I am, and it's worked out so far. Um, it, it's really been uh, <laughs> right place at right time, and then seizing opportunities. Uh, it, I've been extremely fortunate. I use the word lucky all the time. Uh, when I run into people that I use that word with, they say, you know, there's no such thing as luck, or you know, there's there's some, some great sayings about luck out there, which is uh, it's kind of where um, preparedness and opportunity meet. Uh, and, and I believe in that to an extent, but I also believe that you have to have some breaks. And so uh, I got fortunate enough to to find myself in a situation. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I grinded. I mean, I, I was 
I was cold calling. Uh, I, 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 I still have fond memories. So this was 2005. Uh, I, my, my, my dad's office was in the Valley. It was in a, a for, for those of you Valley and, and, and LA cats, we were in a Dr. Lee building. Um, so it was a class C building, uh, on Ventura Boulevard across from Genesta park. Uh, you know, uh, nothing fancy, uh, maybe one window in the entire office and I didn't have one. Um, and, but I would get in the car and, and I remember, <clears throat> You know, my dad would drive and I would be in the passenger seat and I'd have a digital camera and we would drive, you know, we would drive blocks, the east west corridors and the north south and the valley, Sherman Way and Balboa, Ventura Boulevard. And I would literally take a photo of every single property and then come back and dump everything off the memory card onto the computer and then go to go to work researching, you know, going onto the title company's website, the LA County tax assessor, finding out who owns these properties. Um, and just really doing it grassroots. But as far as like how, you know, I ended up getting my breaks, if you will, uh, my dad had a, a few clients, uh, one in particular, who was very active and very loyal. Um, and, and it's a family and they were in the process of uh, recycling out of a bunch of local apartment buildings that they had owned for, for several years. And uh, they wanted to exchange into lower management assets. And so I was doing a lot of the exchange work for that client flying all over the country, looking at single tenant net lease deals. Um, oh, actually going out and, and doing the groundwork and checking out the deals yourself. Yeah, like literally like getting on the planes and sometimes like, I mean, I, I would, everyone would think, oh, this guy's constantly flying. Oh, he's this big, you know, big time guy. He's got all these meetings. I, I'd fly to these markets. I, I wouldn't have a single meeting set up there, nothing. I would literally just go out and I'd be looking at properties, right? And then I'd try my best to meet with developers or whoever the heck would talk to me at the time. Um, but you know, to me, and, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later, but to me, uh, you know, the, 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 the concept of location, location, location is paramount. And I think it's been lost in our industry and, um, you have to, you have to see it and touch it and taste it and, and getting on a plane and flying out to these emerging markets, which at the time were really the only markets that would, would, would talk to me. These were developers that had new construction product that they wanted they wanted to sell. That was their whole goal was to sell. Right. And mm -hmm. so I found myself in these markets, you know, these were in 2005, but these were markets like Nashville and Charlotte and, 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 and all throughout the Carolinas, Florida, Georgia, Texas. Blowing um, up now. Hot now. Yeah. Not, not back then. I mean, these were, I, I can, I remember these were developers that they, you know, we were, I was bringing clients in from California. My California clients were loving the cap rates, right? They were like, this is great. I mean, look at these. These are beautiful properties. They're new construction. They're long-term lease to credit tenants. You could see there's stuff going on. There's, you know, there's road widenings and there's cranes and there's stuff happening. And, you know, it was the best thing for my clients here in California. And then the developers that were on the counterparties to these deals, you know, these locals in, in the Carolinas and Florida and Georgia and Texas, they were like, God damn, you guys are crazy, like paying these prices. Like, you think you guys are getting good deals? I'm telling my friends at the club the price I just got for these properties. They couldn't believe me. They want to talk to you. Right. So that's really kind of how it how it all started. And, you know, it's 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 I wasn't doing, you know, tons of demographic research and uh, population growth. And, uh, you know, I, I could I had always had a good nose for real estate. You I mean you could see the size of it. I've got a lot of potential there. But yeah, same here. <laughs> um, it was always about the location, uh, and and there's just uh, there's so much incredible real estate throughout the country, and so that's really kind of how it all started. Uh, and then uh, again, just being at the right place at the right time, I just started getting uh, dangerous enough. By the time the the recession hit in two thousand eight, mm -hmm. right, and so. Uh, Rather than like a lot of my colleagues here in the business that were working at the CBs and the JLLs and the Cushmans and Colliers or whoever the case may be that were working more in, in a, a little bit more of an institutional environment that they were, you know, doing a lot of local Southern California stuff, Inland Empire, Path of Growth, speculative, right? Putting their clients into deals that it was like, hey, there's a huge pop, right? But the music stopped. Those guys got smoked. Yeah. I got lucky because, you know, our tenants that we were putting our clients into, they kept paying rent through the whole time. They had 15, 20 year leases. They were corporate guarantees. They were, you know, some of them were investment grade. Others were just really good credit. So, you know, I'm at this point, you know, I was born in 81. So I'm whatever, 27, 28, 29 years old, you know, and a lot of the clients that had put these, you know, these, a lot of these clients that had put into these properties were like, yeah, this guy's a genius. Like we're, we're the, the world's literally falling apart. And 
I mean, we're sitting pretty. Like, I want to do more business with this guy. And, you know, look, I, I give some credit to the fact that, you know, I, I took a lot of time and effort to do it right. Right. And always put the client first. But at the same time, like, to be in the single tenant net lease space during the Great Recession was 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 luck. I mean, it really was at the end of the day. It was luck because I was kind of answering a need for this, like, generational wealth transfer that was happening where people were selling management intensive assets here in Southern California and wanting to transition them out of state where they can get higher yield and, and no management. And so, you know, that, that's sort of what we're known for. And, mm-hmm. and that's sort of why and how it happened. Can you tell me a little bit, did you have any mentors along the way? And I mean, obviously your dad was a, a big piece of that, but people that inspired you or kind of helped, you know, give you that instinct for, you know, finding those deals and, you know, not many agents, you know, at that time were flying out and, you know, kicking the tires themselves. Like, where did you get that? Um, so the, the answer is yes, I've had mentors, uh, but not not in the like micro business that I've been running. Um, I also had people that have no idea who I am that I looked up to um, that uh, I wouldn't call them mentors, but I would call them, you know, North Stars, if mm-hmm. you will. Like who? Um, well, I've always admired Eastill as a platform. Uh, they, they, they run their shop like a real estate investment bank. I think they call themselves a real estate investment bank. Uh, they have best in class talent. Uh, they are uh, investing heavily into research and support. Um, and, and it's about the platform um, and, and providing literally like the best in class service you could get out there. Um, and I always sort of question why is there not a platform like that for the lower middle market, right? They're working on $100 million plus deals. They're doing structured finance. They're doing, you know, more investment bank, real estate investment banking. Why does that level of service not exist in the lower middle market, right? When we have when we have investors that are spending 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars, right? That's a massive amount of money. And I know that, you know, these numbers that people throw out these days are insane. But at the same time, like it's an insane, it's an insane amount of money. Like even $5 million is, is an extraordinary amount of money. When you think about like someone with the liquidity that could literally write a check for $5 million, right? I can't do that. Um, and, and yet the level of service that they were being met with was atrocious. It was ridiculous. I mean, embarrassing. It's even, even still today. Um, it's gotten better, I think, because technology has improved, but it's still like the, the, the level of, of service that 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 this piece of the market gets is 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 pretty atrocious and there's extraordinary room for improvement that's where we're focusing all of our time so that was sort of like the north star of like hey like if i can build a platform that's you know east still like for the lower middle market that's sort of like that's that's my aim and then as far as uh as far as uh um mentors it's it's actually it's it's surprisingly some of them have come from the retail shopping industry but 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 most of them have not been um i have uh i, I don't want to you know i don't want to name too many names just because i don't want to i don't want to miss someone and, and and have them left out but uh you know i've i've hosted some panels before and i've invited some of the people that i respect uh to into those panels and um anyone who's seen those panels and watched those panels knows who my mentors are um, but they're, you know, these are people that have, have really conquered the industries in, in industrial, in, in multifamily, in student housing, um, it, you know, manufactured housing. It, it doesn't, it, it, it's really, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's all real estate. Um, and uh, I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent. I'll spend five, 10 seconds on the tangent. But I, I also think that there's a, a loss of, of generalism within the industry, right? Like everyone is trying to hyper-focus, not because they necessarily think that being hyper-focused des- delivers the best service, but because they de- they think it de- delivers the best branding and marketing opportunities, which is, which is complete crap in my opinion, right? Like I am the specialist in XYZ, right? And it becomes like this super laser-guided hyper, hyper-focused uh, you know, sector that completely loses all peripheral vision to the fact that it's part of a greater commercial real estate industry that is part of a large bucket that sloshes back and forth, you know, and, 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 and you have to have that understanding. And so I've always tried myself to maintain this really good peripheral vision and to not just, you know, a micro focus, you know, net lease sector or retail sector, but commercial real estate, uh, in general. Nice. Um, going back to kind of early in your career, did you have any, let's call them favorite mistakes or moments that course corrected you or perhaps things you didn't realize were opportunities at the time that ended up serving you later? 
Um, yeah, so uh, you could ask my wife. I don't have any regrets, um, but uh, but I do. I, I do again, just to the the fortune and the luck. I, I I've I've mistakes that were maybe mistakes at the time uh, were were real learning opportunities or or points of inflection where where I said, hey, I'm actually. That was a painful experience that I went through, but had I not been through that experience, I would not be the person I am today. Can you, uh, can you share one? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is not, it's not anything crazy, but, uh, um, I'll, 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 I'll name him by name and embarrass him. But, uh, there's a, a guy named Tom Caputo, uh, who's a legend in the shopping center space. Anyone in the institutional, uh, grocery anchored shopping center space knows Tom, Nothing but incredible things to say about the guy. Uh, he was the president and CEO of Equity One, a publicly traded REIT that eventually got acquired by Regency Centers. Um, before that, he was at Kimco, um, uh, and and he's been around forever. He's he's truly a godfather of the industry. Um, and uh, you know, there, this was probably 2009, 2010 ish. So mind you, I'm four or five years in the business. I'm. 26, 27 years old, right? Uh, there was a shopping center in Port Wyneme, uh, which is like Ventura County uh, here in Southern California. It was a large, it was probably a 300,000 foot shopping center. Uh, I don't remember what the value was of the time was, but you know, it was, it would have been the largest deal that I had ever done. It was not on the market. Uh, and, um, I had actually fortuitously sat next to Tom at an ICSC open air conference. Uh, I just bought a ticket and went and I got sat randomly next to the president and CEO of Equity One. Uh, so I got lucky, got his card, talked to him and you know, he said, hey, look, we're out buying grocery anchored centers. We're aggressive, like the market sucks, but we have cash, our balance sheet is strong, we're buying. And so I kind of ingratiated myself with uh, with with the, the group that had owned the property and, um, and I called Tom and I told him about generally about the deal, but I was still at the point in my career where I wasn't confident enough to just tell him, hey, here's the address, here's the property. Sort of like, hey, I want you to sign all these, you know, non-circumvents and net and DAs, and I want you to sign my fee agreement in advance so that I don't get screwed and all this stuff. And um, and basically, uh, you know, Tom was a gentleman, but you know, he basically said, like, hey, like I <laughs> Like, I'm not signing this fee agreement. This is a joke. Like, you're asking for 2% on like a $100 million center. Like, you don't, you know, this is not market, right? Like, and, and I basically played, I played, I played, uh, I played, I played the hard card. And I said, well, if you want the deal, you know, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to pay the fee. Um, and Tom basically told me to go F off. <laughs> and he said, you know, keep your deal and uh, go find someone else. And um, that was, a, that was a, a sobering experience. Um, and, uh, so needless to say, the deal didn't get done. I didn't, I did not, I wasn't involved in the deal. Um, but uh, I, I, I did, I did call Tom after the fact and, and told him I was extremely embarrassed by the way that I had acted um, and that this was sort of a new foray for me. And, uh, you know, I apologize and, you know, I'll work for any fee basically. Like, I don't care, pay me a dollar, pay me $10, doesn't matter. Um, if this is if this deal works for you, let's pursue it. So he they ended up pursuing it and he he actually gave me a second chance and he was an absolute mensch about it. Um, but you know I learned I learned something there that is you know hey if you're dealing with high quality people you have to you have to deal in a high quality manner right um, and 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 I think that that really helped set me up for you know the next fifteen years of my career which is. You know, look, we have to dot our I's and cross our T's, but candidly, like the contracts that I sign with my client are just for the file. I mean, they're, they're handshakes, right? I mean, they're these are gentlemen's agreements. These are like, hey, if you're going to screw me, you're going to screw me, right? But at the end of the day, like you're a legitimate person, I'm a legitimate person. We're gonna we're gonna go with this together. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. Nice. Um, let's uh, jump around a bit here and talk about Pegasus Investments in more detail. By the way, one one thing. Yeah, I do want to say. Um, maybe a year or two later, uh, I was at a shopping center in Culver city meeting with an owner, uh, continental development group, uh, and a guy named Yuri Rapinski who owned the property. Uh, and, and, and I left the meeting and I was getting in my car and I get a phone call from Tom 
and he says, "Hey, we just uh, we just uh, uh, you know did some merger and acquisition with it was a company called Capital and Counties, and they had a 1031 exchange that they had to complete, and it was about 115 million dollars." And he's like, "We're aggressive. We're looking for stuff in LA. Do you have anything?" And I, this was literally while I was standing in the parking lot of the shopping center that could have been worth 115 million at the time. I don't know. I'm like, you know, I don't know. Let me let I, I'm actually sitting here in the parking lot of a property. Pull it up on Google Maps. Let me know if you're interested. And so Tom pulls it up on Google Maps. He's like, absolutely. This is incredible. So he's like, would they sell it? I'm like, I don't know. Let me let me find out. So I literally lock my car. I go back upstairs. I, I tell Yuri, I'm like, hey, I just got off the phone with the president and CEO of Equity One. They're a public REIT. They're legit. I've been working with them, trying to find other properties. Would you sell this? He's like, actually, I would. Um, and he named a price. I called Tom. He said, okay. And uh, he got some other executives on the phone at Equity One. And I think within the next day or two, they were on a plane out to LA. They closed and bought that deal. It was a $115 million deal. And that was the largest deal of my entire career to that point. And it really set me up. We got a ton of press. This was like 2011. No one was doing anything. This was, I think, maybe the largest single asset acquisition in the state of California in it for a shopping center at the time. So got a ton of press. And, and that put me on the map and actually ended up setting me up with a future partner that, that, that was relocating from New York to L.A., leaving Equity One. He worked on the deal. He came and joined Pegasus. And, and that basically started our foray into our institutional business. So wow. um, it, it's, it's interesting how that relationship yeah. ended up evolving and, and blossoming. From favorite mistake to happy ending. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly. It's uh, amazing. We love a happy ending. Absolutely. Well, um, I know Pegasus has, has changed a lot over the years. Take us back to 2005 when you were just getting started in the world of commercial real estate. How did Pegasus Investments look then? I mean, it was it was me and my dad. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was it was blocking and tackling. I mean, nothing fancy, uh, everything on a budget. Um, the good old days, candidly, I mean, and that's that's I'll, I'll I will never I will never allow our firm to grow to the point where we forget who our roots are and where our roots are. Um, that was that was real estate in the most purest form, and we still practice it today. Uh, there's you know we do it in a in a glass tower, and you know we do it in nicer suits and you know uh, nicer travel accommodations. And um, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing. Uh, it's you know look, everyone knows this, right? Everyone listening to this podcast knows. They know when you're doing the hardcore blocking and tackling work, the grassroots, thankless, just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, even the really successful guys today, right, that are, you know, that are that are doing, you know, a multi hundred million billion dollars a year plus in business. They know, they remember what it was like when they got started. They know that's the secret sauce. They know if they, if they got back to that, that they would continue to grow their business as opposed to just sort of, you know, riding the wave of what, you know, reputation, right? So I oftentimes, I, I, I have to remind myself, right? Because we, we're, we're incredibly fortunate now. We have, our business is, is referral driven and, and it's a lot of inbound business. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I wish I could be on the phone cold calling more, setting up you know, meetings and introductions and just flying to different parts of the country with no itinerary, no agenda, just hoping I can catch someone at the right time that'll take a meeting with me. Like those, th there's a little bit of, of nuances that we change as we get older and more successful. But at the end of the day, like that's, that's the sauce, right? And so uh, what we were doing in 2005 was the stuff I was telling you about, you know, riding up and down the corridors with my dad, taking pictures of properties researching who the buyers and sellers and owners were and and calling them and it didn't really at the, at that point matter i mean i think my first deal was like a a lease for like 1200 bucks a month for this it was zone commercial but i think it was a house that they filmed porn in i'm not exactly sure but i think that was like my first deal i still remember it was on topanga canyon i'm not going to name the client but that was like the first thing that i got but that's I love that. Yeah. I mean, that's that's that came from organic grassroots outreach. And, you know, something that I did notice, you know, I had the opportunity to visit your office, um, that 
seems consistent with how things started was, you know, your property managers are still flying out and getting boots on the ground, taking photos of the assets. You know, it's not hands off looking from a distance. It's hands on. You're there. You know, you're counting vehicles. You're counting people in and out of the store. You know, tell us a little bit about how, you know, that kind of work ethic has, you know, stayed consistent throughout the years. Um, no shortcuts. I mean, that's a that's a key piece of our culture, right? How do you define culture? I don't know. But I can tell you that if you're a short cutter, you don't have a place at our firm, right? And my goal for the industry is that if you're a short cutter, you don't have a place in our industry either. There's plenty of other industries out there that if you like to shortcut that that you can be successful in. But we're dealing with with way too much money, way too many important ramifications that um, that there's just there's no substitute for shortcuts. Um, and uh, or sorry, there's no substitute for taking the long way. Um, yeah, I mean, look, a part of me wishes that we had an office in every single market that we manage a property in, right? I mean, that would be ideal, right? Um, we're managing 260 properties in 35 states. We have a little over $2 billion in, in assets under management. And if you just calculate the value of the properties that we oversee, uh, I'll, you know, I would say this to my clients, like, would it be better in some respects if we had an office right down the street from the property we were managing? Yes. But if that came at the sacrifice of having this centralized, like brain trust in Century City, um, then, uh, you know, net net, I think it's better that we have the setup that we have and that we constantly have people on planes flying around our vendors, by the way, our partners with us. And, you know, we're, we're not hiring vendors that aren't taking a very aggressive approach towards how the property is maintained. They're taking pictures for us constantly. We have video cameras set up, set, set, set up at the properties. We use Slack for our company. And so, I mean, there's 42 people at our company you know, at any, any given time, someone's flying around somewhere and we have a travel channel, hashtag travel, right? And so anyone that's traveling anywhere, by the way, even for fun, for recreation, yeah. right? Hey, I'm going, I'm going to see my family in Charleston, right? Does anyone have anything here that you guys want me to put eyes on, right? And the asset managers, property managers will apply back, maybe some leasing guys or some acquisitions or dispositions guys, some debt guys will respond back saying, yeah, we're actually working on this deal. Would you mind driving by, taking some pictures and letting us know your thoughts? So we, we have that reach, which is incredible. Um, and, and on that note, by the way, uh, some of the trade-offs that you get of having this like centralized management group versus local property management, which is, I think, the kind of traditional way of doing things, right? It's a local property manager. They're very provincial. You know, they're, they're, you know, they just service a 15, 20, 30-mile radius of where their office is. Going back to that theme of peripheral vision, which I've talked about, um, they lack that. And we have that, right? So most local property management companies, while they may have in a vacuum a slight advantage by being able to drive by the property every day, right? Which I think for multifamily is important, right? Or, you know, multi-tenant office is important. For, you know, for 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 single tenant at least and 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 you know anchored anchored strip centers that have primarily national tenants that are newer construction. Um, where the tenants are very hands-on and very communicative with us. I think that having the peripheral vision that that our asset managers have to sit in Century City, we sit in pipeline meetings as an entire company. It, what, what property management firm is sitting in an office where there's a half a billion dollars a year of investment sales volume trickling through, right? A, you know, $200 million of debt capital markets advisory trickling through, right? 150 leases happening a year. Um, it happens in our four walls and our property managers, our accountants, everyone sits in those four walls in Century City. It's not cheap, right? You look at these property management companies, a lot of them will will stick them in back office, class B, class C, flex industrial where they can get cheap rent, surface parking. Like th that, that, that's not how we operate. We, everyone sits, I sit at the same desk as our lowest level property manager. I don't have an office. They overhear my conversations. They overhear our head of capital markets conversations. They 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 walk by my desk every time on their way in and out of the you know in and out of the the the, the front entryway. If they're going to the bathroom, they we're easily approachable. And that peripheral vision, I think, is incredible. And on a net net basis, that's I think how we deliver a much better service to our clients, even though we're not physically there at each property. I think that also, you know, really speaks to 
the ability to inspire, you know, the group by leading from the front, by being in the trenches, right? And actually letting, you know, the rest of the office you know, like see and hear, hey, this is this is me getting in there, getting my hands dirty with everybody else, right? Um, and I think it definitely differentiates you from other advisories. Can you just elaborate a little bit on what sets Pegasus apart from non-boutique advisories. So by the way, I, I appreciate it. So we talked before before we came on air and 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 I made a, a slight sl a few slight tweaks says, hey, we use advisory, we don't use the word brokerage. You can feel free to use the word brokerage, just not referring to what we do. Right. Right. We we're in the brokerage industry, but we don't conduct traditional brokerage the way that I see other brokerage. No, it, it, it's, so it seems like, you know, it, it's a lot it's a lot more involved than just brokerage. So I think brokerage really sells short what it is you're actually doing. Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're uh, I think we're an outsourced, you know, real estate operation for our clients, right? So whether you are a multi-billion dollar family office that has all of the capabilities to do what we do in-house, um, but just choose not to because you'd rather focus on uh, fundraising, on uh, entitlement, on tenant relations, on M and A, or or other aspects of you know your family business that aren't necessarily you know commercial real estate management. Um, you know we 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 solve that we solve that problem. You could also use us a la carte, right? If you're like, hey, look. I love the fact that you guys are vertically integrated and holistic, right? But I don't need that. I just need a hired gun, right? I, I just need to sell this building or I just need to lease this space or, you know, I just need to refinance my debt coming to. That's fine too. We, we, we do that. Um, but I see those more as funnels and opportunities to create a larger client relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and can you can you talk a little bit about your clients? Like who, who are you working with? Yeah, I mean... You know, we're by, by, by name. I probably shouldn't mention them, but 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 just by profile. Yeah, by profile. It's it's. I mean, look honestly, it's it's anyone. It's anyone. Um, uh, it's anyone that gets what we're doing, uh, that values what we're doing, uh, that we see eye to eye on, and we see the world the same. Um, you know, again, the institutions. Uh, we 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 service some of the largest institutions in the country. Um, they don't. They don't need us for okay. Hey, we have, you know, a billion dollars that we need to deploy from our LPs. Can you do that for us? Right? Go find the sites. Go generate the investment strategy. Go capitalize it. Go finance it. Go lease it. Go build. They're not using us for that. They have all those capabilities, but maybe they have non-core strategies, right? Which, uh, which are 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 needing the same level of high quality execution that is innate to their core business, but that they don't have the apparatus to do internally, mm -hmm. and and they want someone that isn't a competitor of theirs, but that can swim at the same speed that they can. Mm -hmm. So they'll use us, right? We do a ton of asset management for for large institutions. Um, we have started growing out uh, in the last couple of years, but it's really caught fire recently in the last six to 12 months, uh, a lot of trustee work. So corporate trustee work, uh, you know, whether it's a large bank or an independent trustee uh, that's that that's tasked with working through an estate plan, uh, they'll bring us in um, uh, to, to help them execute that plan, whether it's on the asset management or property management side, because again, these aren't necessarily real estate focused people, um, but they have an obligation to their clients mm -hmm. to uh, oversee someone that really knows what they're doing on the ground, and that's us. Uh, but it's not it's not all just like these, you know, insanely deep pocketed institutions and, you know, large banks. It's also it's the mom and pop, too. I, I mean, I, I I I struggle because you know, uh, on one level, um, you know, you could always say, hey, your, your time is better spent working on larger accounts, right? Because you have the capabilities, you have the infrastructure, you have the reputation. It's oftentimes more work, and at the very least, the same amount of work to service a larger client than it is a smaller you know, mom and pop client. But I love those clients. They're real people. And that's who we built our firm off of. And 
And, and candidly, they can benefit or lose the most from good or bad advisory. Right. Um, something that this actually kind of jogs my memory from a conversation we had before. We were talking about some of the strategies that you implemented during COVID that really benefited a lot of your mom and pop clients being able to, you know, help by organizing um, owners with specific tenants. Can you talk a little bit about that that story? And yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Um, you know, uh, so so we have you know, I don't know, I'll use Starbucks as an example, right? So we have, uh, I don't know how many, probably 20 or 30 Starbucks locations that we manage and oversee. Uh, you know, when, when, when COVID hit and Starbucks was out there asking landlords to chip in, right? Uh, they, you know, Starbucks has a lot of institutional landlords, which has, you know, hundreds of their locations, perhaps, um, but they also have a lot of mom and pop one off owners, right? That, you know, don't even know how to get a hold of them, right? Like if you've ever dealt with Starbucks trying to get an Estoppel or an SNDA, they they have like a, a, an anonymous email address that you send to. They don't have a phone number, they don't have anything, right? And so getting a hold of them can be challenging, right? It's because of how many landlords they have. Right. Um, but we were able to kind of use, uh, you know, pool together all of our landlords almost as a class action, right? Not Not in a litigious way, but in more of a like, hey, we have 25 of your stores, right? So rather than you having to hammer out individual rent relief deals on a one-off basis with 25 different mom and pop landlords, some of whom may be overseas, some of them may, may not answer their phone, you may not even have contact information. Why don't we arrive at some sort of plan so that we can leverage what we have, give you guys a an easy solution to kill 25 birds with one stone, and so we were able to do that for a lot of our clients, um, existing clients. That's for that's for Starbucks. So we were able to get incredible, uh, you know, incredible lease modifications done. Whether it's you know, getting rid of cam caps or uh, getting rid of termination rights or getting them to exercise their options early or whatever the case may be, whatever the the, the client's goals were, we kind of got them pre canned and then presented them to Starbucks, and you know, we 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 were able to perform. For our clients, but 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 also for for the tenant, right? Because right. they they were drinking from a fire hose. They had a resource issue. Um, so that was stuff that we already had. We also went on a campaign uh, for mattress firm, which was kind of an interesting thing because we had a number of mattress firms in our portfolio as far as managed portfolio. Um, and I had concerns about mattress firm. Uh, I saw their growth. Uh, a lot of it didn't make sense. Uh, they were paying extraordinary rents in markets that didn't warrant it. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some uh, some stories that came out that were uh, potentially alleging impropriety. There were flags, right? And and mattress firms a great company. They, they they have excellent excellent real estate, and they've been a, they've been a phenomenal tenant of ours. So I, I don't want to smear their name by any means, but at the same time. We saw that there was potential writing on the wall, and they did end up filing for bankruptcy. Um, and so what we ended up doing was was we reached out. We started a campaign. We reached out to as many mattress firm landlords as we could in the country and say, hey, we are pooling you guys together, right? And we'll represent you guys as a class, right? And this isn't necessarily ganging up against mattress firm, right? This is, hey... These guys have thousands of stores they have to deal with and work through, mm -hmm. right? It's it's in their best interest to deal with a single point of contact, right? And it's in your best interest to not be one of one, but you know, one of 50, right? right? And so we were able to do the same thing with them. And we did that with a number of other tenants. And, and I think it worked out great for everyone. And um, you know, we want to do more of those. We yeah. want to do more of those. We did that with we did that with Red Lobster. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been doing a lot of sale leasebacks with with exorbitant rents that we have concerns about. Um, and well, I just saw Rite Aid is uh, Rite Aid's a great in, example. In the news again. I just I just literally yesterday uh, uh, slacked uh, Seth Bell, who runs our asset management group. I said, "Hey, we got to get on the phone with all these Rite Aid landlords. It's good business, but also like candidly, like these people need help. Yeah, because if if you bought a Rite Aid." and you were expecting that they were just gonna be a great tenant and pay rent for the next 15 or 20 years, you had really bad advice. Because, I mean, the writing was on the wall with, with Rite Aid years ago. Right. Um, and so unless you bought a store 
that they were a tenant in hoping that they leave or that they were paying way below market rent and that you'd be fine. It was a redevelopment play. Underlying real estate was really good. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Unless that was your strategy, you got problems. And, and I guarantee you didn't have the right advice going into them. And so I said, look, we need to reach out to these people, right? Not in a predatory way, right? Which a lot of people in our industry do, right? Blood in the water, there come the sharks, right? No, that's not our approach. Our approach is, hey, you got bad advice, but there's, there's a way out of this. Uh, let's, let's discuss it. We'll give you, you know, we'll give you our opinion on, on what your options are and, and we can take it from there. And so that's a new campaign that you astutely pointed out that we're, we're in the throes of putting together right now. And this is actually a really good segue into our third topic, which is getting more into the nuts and bolts of commercial real estate today. Um, love to ask more questions about the market overall. You know, what's your 35,000 foot overview of the commercial real estate sector today? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Honestly, I have no idea. Um, I, I'm I'm constantly asking people far more uh, intelligent than myself uh, where things are headed. Um, I can tell you what I've been telling my clients, uh, which you know from uh, you know from a classic brokerage perspective is gonna is gonna be alarming, but uh, but but I, I believe it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, if you don't have to sell right now, I wouldn't sell. Uh, or if you don't have some overwhelming reason to sell, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Uh, if you don't have an overwhelming reason to buy, I wouldn't. Um, and if you don't have an overwhelming reason to refinance, I wouldn't. So, um, hold tight. <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, hold tight. I mean, you know, look, are there any, are there any market indicators that you're looking for that, you know, would give a better sense of which way things are swinging right now. Because I know, you know, obviously interest rates has been on, you know, everybody's tongue lately. And, you know, are we just waiting for those to change? Like, what, what, what are you looking for to say definitively, hey, you know, which way we're going? You know, look, I, 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 like I said, I'm bad at predicting the future, but the, the nice thing about our business is that I don't really think you have to be a great predictor of the future as far as the markets are concerned, because what we're focused on are, you know, long-term generational holds, right? So we're advising people that are owning assets for a long-term, right? And I don't know what the statistics are. I mean, you could talk to any you know, you know, any wealth advisor or economist, but, you know, if you, if you bought at the height, right, and sold at a trough, but you held for at least 10 years, you made money in any single cycle, right? Um, and so I don't really focus that much on like, sort of like what the market's going to do. I think the more important thing for people to be doing in, in my position as advisors is really be paying attention to what's happening right now mm -hmm. and 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 what happened in the last several years. I'm a really good storyteller as far as like, I know exactly what happened and I know how we got here and I know what's going on right now because we, we have such a broad reach into the market. We're representing buyers, we're representing sellers at the same time, right? So if I'm repping a buyer and I'm, you know, and I'm peppering the market with offers and I'm seeing how they respond. Are they responding hard? Are they responding soft? I can then use that intelligence to then advise our sellers. Hey, I'm actually on the other side of the table with multiple other transactions. Here's the experience I'm seeing. And so I think that real time information is, is, is probably far more important than what's going to happen a year from now, two years from now, three years give, from now. Give me some of that real time. What, what are you saying right now? Um, it's a mixed bag. Um, Pricing softened for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that buyers uh, have expected an apocalyptic, you know, feeding frenzy or, you know, kid in a candy store opportunity. It's not here. Right. It hasn't come. Um, it hasn't, it hasn't arrived. I mean, cap rates are off. Prices are off probably a hundred basis points, right? Four caps are fives now, fives are sixes, right? Sixes or sevens. Are you seeing sellers kind of come to the table with uh, a little more flexibility than previously? Yeah, I am. Um, I'm seeing more sellers proactively come to us saying, hey, I wanna price this, but I actually wanna sell it. Like, don't give me a price that's 
aspirational, like, hey, maybe we get lucky and find the right buyer. But like, hey, like, where does this clear the market? So I'm, I'm having a lot more of those kind of conversations, which I think is good. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that there are far fewer aspirational sellers today than there were, you know, two years ago, for sure. Do you have any surprising or maybe controversial thoughts about the current market happenings or anything you'd like to share? Um, controversial in what way? I mean, in any way, um, I think, you know, you've taken a, a pretty realistic stance on, look, if you don't have to do anything, don't right, right. now. Um, but, you know, anything that sticks out at you in terms of, you know, if I'm a, let's say a seller in this market, this is where my head should be. Um, yeah, I think oftentimes your first offer is your best offer. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in that. The market's shallow. Uh, I think first impressions are everything in life. So uh, if you're going to take an asset out to market, make sure it's ready for prime time, right? We have a lot of clients where, you know, <laughs> The, the, this the, isn't the time to just dip the, your toe in. Yeah, the rebar it. and is, is still in the ground and like there's, you know, the, there's not even vertical sticks and they're like, hey, can you put like a rendering or something? And like, uh, no, I mean, can we? Sure. Should we? No. Why are you asking me this question? You know better. Um, wait until it's ready to be sold because you're going to get one bite at the apple. And um, as big as this industry is, right? Crexy's made it a lot smaller, right? So, um, you know, everything, you know, for the most part, you know, when you put something out there, everyone's going to see it, right? And so um, I think you do it right and you do it once um, in a, in a, in a, in a very, very robust upwardly facing market, you get second, third, fourth bites at the apple, you get 12 offers, you know, you piss off the first two or three because you did three rounds of best and final. And they finally said, forget these people. They're greedy. I don't want to deal with them. And then, but you got eight people who feel like sore losers that they want another, like we don't have that anymore. Right. right? We have one, two, maybe three offers. If it's a really good asset. Now kind of uh, flipping to the other side of the table now as a buyer right now, you know, where are the opportunities? What are you looking at? Are you necessarily jumping on something now? Or if you're seeing a deal, is it, Hey, maybe if I hold out for another, you know, four, six months, I'm getting a better deal. Yeah. I think, I think, look, if, if you're in the business of buying and it's just, it's your business and you're a quiz and you, ha- and you have a, a, a platform and that's what you do, right. Whether you're a fund or a syndicator or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I think there's always, I think regardless of the markets, there's always opportunities to be buying. Um, it's just a lot harder, right? Mm-hmm. So I found that people are great at making excuses, right? So (laughs) when the market was on fire two years ago, you know, buyers were complaining, right? Now that it's softened and cooled, buyers are complaining, right? So it's like enough with the complaints, just, you know, focus. You may have to kiss 10 frogs now before you find the prince instead of three. Right. You just have to work harder, but there's deals out there. And, 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 and if, and if and if the proverbial you know hits the fan, um, then it'll be easier. You know, then yeah, you'll be a kid in a candy store. But I mean, I've been doing this for eighteen years, and you know, we went through a period of maybe two that it was like that. Mm-hmm. The other sixteen were pretty just regular market dynamics, and if you sat on the sideline for 16 years waiting to feed, it's almost like, you know, it's that, it's that player at the poker table that just sits there the whole night waiting for pocket aces and it folds every hand. Yeah. They fold every hand or, you know, maybe they end up going in and they end up getting beat anyways. But like, you know, it's, it's a cadence that you have to keep up, you know, play smart hands. Um, but, but stay in the game. Good advice. All right. Um, I'm just going to, uh, take us here to our fourth topic and you know, this is something that we do with all of our guests. So given your specialized background and expertise, I'm sure listeners are going to be curious to your answers to some of our rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. If you were given $50 million. Are they rapid fire to answers also? Well, I mean, you can, you can take your time on them. Um, if you were given $50 million today, had to spend, had to invest it immediately, what would be your go-to asset type and location and why? 
Um, so I saw this question in advance. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna admit that that a little bit of cheating. I did think about it. I, I would I would invest in our company. Honestly, um, we have uh, an unbelievable opportunity to acquire talent right now. Um, you know the the brokerage model is broken broken. Okay, and uh, you know rising tide lifts all ships, uh, and um, you know, it, it's uh, as far as being a kid in a candy store, the talent that we're seeing come through the door is incredible. We can't keep up with it. I wish we could. So if I had $50 million, I'd pump it all back into our company uh, and, and, and acquire the best talent I could acquire. Uh, we've been, uh, we've, we've got an incredible uh, special operations development team uh, that has been building out a proprietary software platform for us. That's already operational. We're already using it. We've been using it for the last few years, uh, but it's going into Gen 2, Gen 3, um, client portals, uh, unbelievable uh, collaboration between our, our different service lines so that you know all different parts of the company are looking at the property in real time and, and full collaboration information sharing allowing clients to see into not only the transaction, but their pro So there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff. It's just candidly, like there's limited resources. So if I had 50 million bucks, I'd, I'd do that. All right. Fair enough. I might also buy like a yacht or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, favorite tool or software that you use on the job? Um, not well, a trick, not a trick, trick question. So. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, so, I have to plug our software, which we are not licensing or anything out to third parties. It's just for our own. It's called Property Arc. It's awesome. Um, we use Arc because it's like Noah's Ark. It basically takes you from where the flooding is to the promised land. <laughs> so kind of connecting everyone together. I like that. Um, so obviously, I love that. Um, no BS. I love. I do love Crexy. Um, look, we're huge CoStar LoopNet clients. We have to be. Um, I know these guys are probably going to listen in. I, I, I welcome Crexy because um, I think that they're you guys have pushed them um, and you guys have really pushed the industry. I personally enjoy your software better. It's way more user friendly. The UI is incredible. Um, it's you don't feel like you're gouged at every single turn. Uh, there's so much that's thrown in. Uh, you have to have the premium user account. But um, no, it's incredible. I mean, it's it's I showed our marketing guys because uh, not everyone at our office has a premium account. I showed him my account and like all the deals that we have and like the fact that that you guys are showing us literally names, phone numbers, email addresses, company names, ad like of everyone that's even looked at our property, it's incredible. We, we don't get that information from any other, you know, any other service. So you guys have been unbelievable. Keep doing it. Like, you know, some people are like, oh yeah, take CoStar down, take Loop down. Like, like they need to get, like, look, I'm not, I'm not taking it that far, but- at the very least, if you guys can keep doing what you're doing to push them to, to get into this next generation of, of, of how we utilize platforms, then great, right? Um, I love Placer. I mean, Placer is incredible. Um, it's hit and miss. Mm -hmm. um, I like it for a number of different reasons. I mean, look, it's all about triangulating Intel, right? So, you know, you're never going to rely on a single source to get something done, right? Like, just like, as a as an advisor, I would not. I, I, Crexy's a tool. It's not a it's not a threat, right? Even though my clients can go on Crexy and find properties themselves and list properties themselves, and actually they can't. They need a, a broker of record and a listing agent to put anything on Crexy. Oh, really? Yeah, we don't have for sale by owner on our. Oh, platform. interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe that's why the quality's so good. I mean, uh, <laughs> I would agree. Well, but they can go on and look to buy. They can go on and they can search. It's they can it, search. It's an open platform, so anybody can go and search and see everything that we've got, you know, for sale, for lease. So right, you know, and that which regard, they could cut out. Open. They could they could cut out the middleman, right? But at the end of the day, that should just be a tool, right? And and at the end of the day, you should have um, multiple ways of sourcing product, right? So we tell our clients. So we run an exclusive buy side advisory business. So. We get people all the time call us up, hey, I'm in an exchange, you know, here's what I'm looking for. Okay, and then I try to convert that conversation to like, how are you going about doing this? Do you have an, a broker or an advisor that you've hired and blah, blah, blah. And inevitably, most of the time, it's no, I'm just, you know, I'm talking to a bunch of different people and this and that. I'm like, okay, well, can we set up a meeting where I can actually walk you through why it makes sense to hire an exclusive advisor? Okay, doesn't have to be us, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. But 
entrust your exchange to a single point of contact so that you don't confuse the market, so that you don't have misalignment of interests. Right. There's so much crap that goes along with like, you know, I call them deer running through the woods, right? Like mm -hmm. there's all these hunters that have their scopes out just ready to fire, right? Mm -hmm. That's not how we operate because we don't operate in that world. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Placer is just another like tool that, you know, from a marketing perspective, look, it's great, right? We show it to our clients and we can say, hey, look, we can actually track foot traffic at each of these locations. Like think about how much more intelligent we are about underwriting the real estate when we're, you know, advising you on the acquisition. It's great, right? Like to an outsider, they think it's the best thing since sliced bread. It's like, wow, you have access to that? That's incredible. It's great, but it's just one of like dozens of tools we use, right? Right. Um, uh, as far as you know, other other resources, um, you know, just I'll I'll go on to Placer again, uh, just because they've been incredibly helpful for us on the management side as well, right? Like we're now able to track across you know a multi billion dollar portfolio foot traffic in real time. We get sales reporting on you know hundreds of tenants, mm -hmm. so we can match up the sales reporting against Placer's rankings, and and it's phenomenal. So nice, yeah. And then uh, what is the most common misconception about your job or industry? Misconception. Um, I don't think there is one. I think, I, think, uh, I think the conception that people have, which is that it's, uh, it's, it's a broken industry, is, is dead on. Um, I don't think it's a misconception. I think that, uh, you know, I'm not going to hammer on it, but uh, I, I, I'm embarrassed and I hate uh, – 90% of the people in this industry, they're, they're lazy. Um, they're out for themselves. Um, they put their clients last, maybe not last, but definitely behind themselves. Um, and, uh, and it's broken. And I think that, I think that the perception is, is, is real. And I hope that, um, you know, that the Pegasus can not only capitalize on that vacuum that's being, being left just for whatever reason, I can't put my finger on it's 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 insane. It's silly. Act in a certain way, your business will be phenomenally better um, in in the long run for sure. Um, but I think the industry needs to be called out because I think the interests are completely misaligned, and I think that commercial real estate uh, brokerage is 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 prime for a an evolution uh, similar to the way that Wall Street and the financial services industry went through mm -hmm. you know 15 20 years ago when it went from stockbrokers cold calling you know retail clients trying to you know slam stock sales down their throat uh, in a very transactional approach to now you don't have that you have wealth management holistic advisory where they're plugging in you know, insurance and estate planning and, you know, fixed income portfolios and, you know, oh, we can help you with your home mortgage. We can help you with your business line of credit and sort of let's take a look rather than just trying to come up with a new hot thing, right, to try and sell you on. Mm -hmm. Let's understand who you are, what your goals are. And our different services are really just tools to execute a strategy. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that you know, people operating in this space with the same kind of work ethics and just overall ethics would agree. I hope so. And uh, finally, what's your most recommended book and why? <laughs> um, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I, I really, I don't, I don't read a lot of books. I don't read a lot of books. I read Any a, podcasts that I read, you, like you're really into? I, or? No, I, I, read a, I read a ton of articles. I mean, uh, you know, I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and you know, the worst thing you could do is pick up your phone and shine a bright light into your pupils. But uh, I do that. I'm guilty of it. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go through and I'll read the journal and, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, I read a ton of articles, uh, about the industry. Uh, you know, CoStar does a great job putting out, uh, you know, a really good content. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I try to stick, there's so much, content to consume out there. Mm -hmm. I try to keep it as, as localized as possible, but just be uh, immersed within yeah. the market. Yeah. 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 Nice. All right. As we wrap up any parting words you'd like to share with our audience? No, I mean, I, I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us and sharing your insights. 
Uh, I know you're really busy and we appreciate you taking the time to sit with us. A lot less busy today. <laughs> <laughs> um, if people want to get in touch, where can they find you? Email, uh, website? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, apprehensively give my, uh, give my cell phone number. It's 310-710-7172. Um, All right. And uh, I, can, I can promise you that I likely won't answer your phone call, but I will return it. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to everybody that tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, do not miss the next one. Visit go.crexy.com forward slash podcast to get the next episode. You can also see videos of our podcasts on our YouTube channel. Uh, again, the Crexy podcast on your favorite podcast app and YouTube for video recordings of each episode. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.